Spotlight is a production of CTNY, the Catholic Television Network of Youngstown. It seeks to spotlight people, places, and events from around the Diocese of Youngstown that promote the new gospel of joy called for by Pope Francis. Your program host is Father James Corda. Hello and welcome to Spotlight. I'm Father Jim Corda. Joining me is Bishop Marcus Miller, who is the retired bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you, Father Corda. We're going to mainly talk about uh, Catholic Lutheran dialogue, uh, but I think it would be good for us to kind of set the scene before that is to talk about ecumenism. Uh, what exactly do we mean when we use that word ecumenical? Well, I think it means every, every initiative we have, every program that's developed, every opportunity we have to cooperate across denominational lines in the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So wherever it is that Lutherans and Catholics have an opportunity to work together, to find our common faith, to together proclaim the presence of Jesus Christ. This would be what we call ecumenical. Of course, it has multiple definitions. It has more of a academic definition. It means trying to find those theological uh, convergences that our two communions have. But I think in the very practical sense, it means how do Christians work together and how do we give voice and action to the presence of Christ. You know, that's not always been, unfortunately, the case in, in um, uh, religions getting along together, uh, and in, in particular Christian religions. And right. when you think about it, there's kind of a, an anomaly there because Christians should all get along. Well, we really know? should. That's what our Lord desires mm -hmm. of us. He, he wants us not just to love each other within the communion. He wants us to love all people. And uh, you're right, oftentimes our differences have been our primary mode of relating rather than what we have in common. And I think the commonalities, uh, not to trivialize that, but I think those are significant oftentimes. And uh, we're going to talk probably a little later on in the show about some of the common things that the Catholics and Lutherans have in common. But in your experience uh, with uh, dialoguing with other Christians uh, and other people of, of faith, uh, how does that sense of respect and cooperation uh, become imperative as the beginnings of any kind of dialogue? Well, I, I, what I've learned in my time as a, as a bishop, but before that as a parish pastor and working with uh, neighboring congregations and parishes, um, is that there are two levels of relationship. One is the kind of the theological or the faith statement relationship where we discover we both confess the Apostles' Creed, for example. But then there's the, the deeper relationship of friendship that's developed that's so important. Um, when I was a parish pastor near Cleveland, we were next door to a Melkite Catholic church. And... Um, when we, when we moved to Cleveland, I, I, these were new people to me. I'd never met Melkites before. But it was over tea and coffee and in the rectory that I had a chance to get to know the priest there. And our two congregations then developed a deeper relationship. And it was that friendship that was so important. And I really think that's kind of the beginning, isn't it? That, that we, we, uh, we have this relationship that starts. And, and that is, uh, is so important because it's, it begins as a one-on-one. -on -one. Right. You know, I would think that that relationship between you and, and the priest was, was really kind of the seed, and then that grew out into your own congregations. And, and how important is a, as a leader within a faith community that you need to kind of plant those seeds and, and get people to understand the, the need for respect and cooperation among Christians? Well, it's just vital that whether it's the next door neighbor or your cousin or whoever it is that you're seeking a deeper relationship with in faith and in life, 
um, that you spend time together. You simply spend time together. And more important than speaking, that you really listen. You know how often uh, in our conversations with people, that's the one thing that many of us don't do, oh, that's is listen. Sure. That's you know, we're, we're great at talking, we're great at telling our story or, or talking about us. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to actually listening to the other person, I think that's really imperative. There's the movement called a marriage encounter and they actually take time. There's a, like a 10 in 10 where for 10 minutes, the, the one spouse speaks and the other just listens. And then the other, and then it's flipped. And so how important is that, you know, just to listen, but then that leads to other things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Just the listening is, uh, you learn so much about yourself when you listen, not just about the other person. You learn about yourself. You learn about your own ability to be patient. But then it's always interesting to me to hear how other people see me and what they assume when I get into a ecumenical dialogue, what people have assumed it means to be a Lutheran pastor or a bishop. And uh, to hear that and understand better where that came from. And I would imagine in, in, uh, in any kind of ecumenical dialogue or, or talk, there are those certain myths that, that people have. Mm -hmm. You know, we have certain myths about certain traditions or faiths and, and vice versa. And I think it's important to kind of dispel those myths because once we do that, we have a better understanding. And there's that sense of sometimes we're kind of ignorant about things as well. And that's really kind of like a, a stumbling block, I think, and a barrier to ecumenical dialogue. It's absolutely important to put the myths on the table, to, to talk about what I think, for example, Catholics believe or the Catholics practice and let people respond to that and see if, see if I have it right or not. And uh, more often than not, I don't have it right. You know, the interesting thing when you mention that is that there's a lot of times, and it's probably true in, in any kind of denomination, that sometimes what we believe, we don't always know why we believe it. Right. But it was something that was taught to us. And so I do it or I live it because this is what I was taught. How important it is to kind of get to um, why it is that I believe what I live and how important that is. Mm -hmm. you know? We're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but we wanna um, talk in just a moment about uh, Martin Luther and some historical background. But before we do that, we're gonna take a quick break. So okay. please stay with us. We'll be right back. What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. Light Moments. Here's Father Tom McSweeney. If you ever thought it would be wonderful to be a philanthropist, you can be. The word philanthropist has Greek origins and means lover of people. So while you may not be able to help others financially, you can provide for their welfare by giving from your heart. And that doesn't just mean feeling benevolent, but also acting generously. Here's just a few reminders. First, be sensitive to the moods and the needs of others. And next, learn to listen, really listen to people. Be quick to pay a sincere compliment and be generous with your praise. Always show a cheerful disposition and go out of your way to be kind. True lovers of people do unto others as they would have others do unto them. These philanthropists understand that the golden rule isn't just golden, it's priceless. This message from the Christophers, New York, New York, 10017. Welcome back to Spotlight. I'm talking with Bishop Marcus Miller of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Before we took a break, we were basically talking about our different faiths and ecumenism. Uh, 
I'd like to spend this segment of our time together to talk about, we know that in 2017, it's the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Right. Let's talk a little bit about that historically, if we could kind of set the stage for the folks that are with us that may not be familiar with uh, Martin Luther and the Reformation. Sure. Do you mind sharing some his historical background with us? Well, Luther uh, grew up in a working family. His uh, dad was uh, worked hard. Um, he was a devout member of the church. Um, Luther's dad wanted him to be an attorney. Uh, Luther decided to become a priest uh, and eventually became an Augustinian monk um, and was a professor. And uh, through his study of scripture and his own faith journey and struggle, uh, Luther came to the point where he thought the church needed to be reformed. And uh, as a devout member of the church, he wanted this reformation to take place. And so this anniversary that you speak of really is a mark of, on October 31st, 1517, uh, Luther posting 95 theses on the door of the chapel in Wittenberg, Germany, calling on... Um, calling for conversation, really, in the church on some matters of faith that Luther thought were at stake in the church. And as things happen so often, uh, one thing led to another, and it resulted in a split in the church that continues to this day. Uh, I don't think that was Luther's initial intent um, for the church to divide. I think Luther really wanted to see the church reformed. Mm -hmm. What can we learn by that? Uh, historical uh, aspect of, of kind of the splitting of churches. What, in retrospect, what is something that we can learn today mm -hmm. in, in, in applying it to how we are called to dialogue and how we are called to look at those common things that bind us? Right. Well, I think, at least as I look back on that history, it, it always is interesting to me about how one thing leads to another if we're not enormously patient with each other. And uh, I think as we look at the divide that took place in the 16th century between what we now call Lutherans and, and the Church and the Roman Catholic Church, um, was a result of a, a, a series of events and personalities that if there had been a little more patience with each other, a little more capacity to listen to each other, perhaps Luther's initial intent of seeking reform or clarity in the church could have been realized. I mean, you can give us plenty of history from the Roman Catholic Church where it has in fact gone through periods of reform and renewal and, and re, even reconfiguration to be more faithful, and uh, that was what Luther sought. So I, I think what we can learn perhaps is to always be patient with each other. In our, um, in our catechism, uh, Luther himself wrote, and the meaning to what we call the Eighth Commandment of not bearing false witness, mm -hmm. his meaning is always put the best construction on what your neighbor says. Always understand what your neighbor says in the best possible light. I think that's always good advice. I think it's excellent advice. Let's go back to that word reform mm -hmm. and, and how imperative it really is. Uh, I think in our, not only in our institutional lives, but in our personal lives. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that constant call to, to change and to, to reform um, because we're, we can't stay stagnant in our faith and how important it is to to grow in our faith. Yeah, I don't know if it's true in your uh, congregation, but I would imagine it is as it is in ours, that we have a, a, a number of older people that say, you know, I can't learn anything new. This is it and I'm, I'm kind of done with it. What do we, what do, we do with the, the people that get to a point of, I guess it's maybe complacency in a nice word, that we have to move on, we have to grow, we have to change. Doesn't mean we have to always agree, but, but you know, there's this respect and this, this openness that's got to be there. Is that your experience as well? 
Well, I think so, although I do have to say that um, I observe that when older people who sometimes get stuck are in conversation with their grandchildren, that is such a rich conversation. And uh, especially when you see grandparents who want to make sure that the faith is passed on to their grandchildren and the attention that they give. And then capacity, sometimes we talk about older people like me who don't, who get stuck. We're not stuck. When we see, when we listen to what our grandchildren do and what their hurts are and what their joys are, we are pretty adaptable people, but it's in that conversation that we have with grandchildren. And I think that's part of the church's obligation to make sure that we have the generations that are together and are talking to each other. Definitely. Let's go back to the anniversary that uh, will be celebrated in mm -hmm. uh, a few years. What is uh, going to be significant about it? 500 years is really a long time. Uh, you know, f for us, you know, we kind of measure things in time, and sometimes that's unfair, but, but oftentimes it's significant. What is it that the Lutheran Church will celebrate and commemorate uh, in 2017? Well, uh, my hope is that it becomes an occasion for us to ask the question, how can we uh, deepen our connections to the rest of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the Reformation has been, the, the observance of the Reformation has been an occasion to build barriers. I hope it's an occasion for us to say we need to take these barriers down. And um, especially around the article that caused the Reformation, which is the article of justification by faith. We've come, since 1999, we've come to a common understanding of that, and that needs to continue to be celebrated. We need to give thanks to God for that, and then use that as a springboard for finding other ways to deepen our relationship. I know a lot of times it can be a, a celebration. I hope it's an observance. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to take a break in a moment, but before we do that, what do you feel would be significant, speaking for us Catholics? about the Reformation, about this, this commemoration? I've, I tell people um, one of the myths in the Lutheran Church is that the gospel is clouded in the Catholic Church. And my urging to them is attend Mass and listen to the local parish priest preach and you will hear the gospel. And that's so important uh, that we know that the gospel is being proclaimed faithfully. and. All I would say for you, keep doing what you're doing. Bishop Miller, we're going to take a quick break. Okay. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Johnsons enjoy Friday dinners out. Nothing fancy, just time together to reconnect as family. They make sure others eat as well. By giving to Catholic Charities of Youngstown, the Johnsons join other angels who care for those in need, regardless of religion or race. Show your wings with a gift to Catholic Charities changing lives one family at a time, providing housing, emergency financial assistance, senior services, and more. Give now at ccdoy.org. I am Marinol. Je suis Marinol. I am Marinol. I believe that we are all connected to each other, and that it is the gift of compassion that unites us and makes us one. It doesn't matter what language, culture, or tradition we come from. We can share compassion wherever we are. Mary Knoll, an American Catholic organization of priests and brothers, has been reaching out to those in need for nearly 100 years in 26 countries throughout the world. Mary Knoll dedicates 86 cents of every dollar donated to their programs, and with your help, they can do more. Missionaries, workers, volunteers, supporters, we are all Mary Knoll. I am Mary Knoll. Yo soy Marino. I'm Father Mike. And I am Marino. 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 Welcome back to Spotlight. I'm talking with Lutheran Bishop Marcus Miller. And we know that uh, when Bishop Tobin was here uh, many years ago, that you and he entered into a, a special covenant. 
Can you give us a little background into that and uh, what brought that all about? Well, I think it was our friendship that brought it about. I think it was uh, some of our staff were, grew close to each other. I think there were occasions, especially within the Youngstown Diocese, where we had Lutheran congregations and Catholic parishes that had a history mm -hmm. of cooperation and collaboration, uh, where they worked together on common projects in their communities and feeding the hungry, or in gathering together for Thanksgiving observances or whatever. And that sort of bubbled up into the bishop's offices. And mm -hmm. it was one of those, uh, I, I think, spirit-led occasions where staff came together and they liked each other and they wanted to work together and they brought the bishops together and we liked each other and we enjoyed being together and listening to each other and challenging each other and encouraging each other. And that eventually then led to the development of a covenant that we signed at a special service at the St. Columba Cathedral, which was, a, I would say, one of the high points of my tenure as bishop in this territory. It was a, it was a marvelous evening. It was. A, what do we mean by that word covenant? When we use the word to signify what happened, why is that important and significant? Well, for me, the covenant means that we won't take uh, any unilateral action that doesn't take into account our, our covenant partners. That we recognize that when Lutherans act, whether it's nationally or locally or in the local congregation or parish, that we need to take into account our Catholic friends and our Catholic brothers and sisters. So, for example, if the local congregation wanted to start um, a new after-school program, mm -hmm. and there's a Catholic church three blocks away, at least there ought to be an occasion to walk down the street and ask, is there a way that we can do this together? Uh, we have uh, people to serve. Is there something we have in common that we can do together? Um, in your experience over these last uh, many years, and of course you're retired now, but how have you seen that develop and grow and mature since that, that beginning, since that beginning of the covenant? Well, it happens, it happens very locally. It happens, it happens individually, I think, too. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm not familiar enough. I've been gone for a while from the territory, but when I was here, I, I, I think I see it in the friendships that are there. I, when I attend, for example, a, a congregation's anniversary or the dedication of a new building and the priest from the local Catholic parish comes and brings a greeting from his congregation or when there are programs that are developed together or when there are social occasions where people are together. I think this is all part of the um, outcome of the covenant that we signed. And I think that goes back to what we discussed in the beginning is that it really begins with relationships. It does. And, uh, and, and once those are forged and um, solidified and made in a covenant, if, you, if we can use that word again, then there's this, this uh, path, this common path that we walk together. Exactly. And, and as we walk that path, what would be some of the hopes that you would have as a, as a leader in the, in the Lutheran Church and also in dialogue with the Catholic Church that you'd like to see as time goes on? Well, I think whenever you walk a path together, it's important to know where are we headed. And for me, and I think generally speaking for the, uh, the, all the people engaged in dialogue, our hope is to be reconciled at the table of the Eucharist. This is the, this is the goal. Now, that's a, that's a ways away. Um, I'm not sure that'll occur in my lifetime, although I still pray for that. Um, Nevertheless, while that's the goal, I think there are always surprises along the way and joyful occasions along the way. So even though we might not be to the goal yet, we ought not miss those joyful surprises and delights that God puts before us along the way as we seek to get there. And let's go back to some of the common things 
that we share together uh, as Lutherans and Catholics that we want to build on and continue uh, that we actually can celebrate together as we try to meet that goal. What are some of the common things that stand out in your experience and also that you'd like to share with the folks that are with us? I think first of all, it's important to realize that we have a common uh, faith about baptism, that we understand baptism the same way, that we, that then, then, then that leads to, uh, we really do have a common understanding about the presence of Christ in the, in the Eucharist. We, we use sometimes different language, but that Christ is truly present for us in this sacrament is, is something we hold in, in, in common. I think a commitment that we have to serve the poor and our neighbors is, is something that we hold deeply in, in common with each other. Um, I think the desire to bring the message of Christ to the world is something we hold in common with each other. And so just on the basis of those items alone, I. I've been very moved by Pope Francis' call for evangelization. Um, and I, I tell our pastors in the Lutheran Church, uh, we need to read this, uh, the hope of the gospel, uh, that um, his comments on evangelization are comments directed to you, but they are very, very germane to us. You know, it's interesting because I was uh, with a group of priests the other day, and we uh, were talking about what the impact of, of Francis is on the church. And of course, whenever there's a new leader, uh, we always think, well, what's going to change? Are there right. going to be any significant changes? And, and obviously there's things in our doctrine that, that are unchangeable. But I brought up the idea that perhaps what he's doing is to give the church kind of a different light mm. and uh, sharing with us uh, how he lives his faith and he does that with people of other faiths and people with no faith and how important that is uh, in forging our human relationships and that brings about reform and change and and covenant together it absolutely does i think uh, i think his example his teaching uh, his leadership will be significant for this century and across faith lines, not just even among Christians, but I think across faith lines. Bishop Marcus Miller, it was a pleasure to have you on the show today, and God bless you in your retirement thank you. and uh, in your ministry. Thank, thank you, very you much. so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Have a good day, and God be with you. Spotlight has been a production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. Your program host was Father James Corda. By the time we can walk, each of us yearns for the joy that comes from being able to do for ourselves. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Church World Service.